So, by God's grace, you put upon our heart a drash to share with us called Highways to Zion. Highways to Zion. Highways to Zion. And automatically, you should begin to see highways, highways. There are many highways in the air, in the land, and on the sea. Highways. And it's going one way to Zion. Physical Zion and Monk Zion. So we're keeping that in mind as we go forward. Highways to Zion. So David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, gives us this text in Psalm 84. In Psalm 84, we have this text. How blessed is the man, the person, all right? So this is a blessing, whose strength is in you, in God, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Highways to Zion. I'm going to interchange between Zion and Zion, right? One is Hebrew, one is English. But notice, a blessing comes when our mind, because when you see heart, is mind, in whose mind are highways to Zion. So in other words, God is saying, are you thinking about Zion? If you are, then you are blessed. If you're not thinking about Zion, you need to be thinking about Zion because Zion is on God's heart. And whatever is in God's heart ought to be on our heart. So God is asking us, do you want this blessing? How blessed is the man whose strength is in you? Praying for Zion and praying to go on the highways of Zion requires strength. And so may, may we be strengthened with strength in the inner man. All right? So this is a blessing to have our hearts set on pilgrimage. I want you to think about that. And think about heavenly and earthly, because that's what, how I'm going to be speaking. I want us to look at highways to Zion physically and highways to Mount Zion spiritually. Let's look at a text that is written, the last book of the Tanakh, Second Chronicles. Now, some of us may say, but the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. Well, you should know that the arrangement with the Christian Bible and the Jewish Bible is different. So in the Jewish Bible, it is arranged differently. And in the Jewish Bible, the last book of the Jewish Bible is Second Chronicles. In the Christian Bible, it's Malachi, right? That good Italian Jew prophet, right? Malachi, right? But in Second Chronicles, that's the last book. So look at what is the last book in Chronicles. Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, Adonai, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. You should begin to know what time period we're talking about, right? This is the kingdom of the Medo Persia, right? He has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem. Imagine this. A non-Jew appointed to build the house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever among you of all his people may go up and may Adonai his God be with him. I want you to see that last part. Cyrus is saying, may all go up. That is the word Aliyah. Cyrus is saying, I am releasing you to go up. I am releasing you to ascend. As opposed to the last book in the Christian Bible, it is curse. But the last book in the Jewish Bible is Aliyah, go up. Hmm. May God help us to begin to think. You see, when our master Yeshua taught, he is a Jewish rabbi, and he said, listen, I'm going to come to open your eyes to the threefold division of the Tanakh. I'm using Tanakh and not Old Testament, because there's nothing old about it. It's the Older Testament. But I want to use the word Tanakh, which means it's an acronym for Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. It means Torah, Prophets, and Writings. Again, you and I should know this because we are a Messianic community and we are knowing about this. So the Old Testament, and I'm just using that word so that we could understand, the Old Testament slash Tanakh is divided into three parts. The Torah, the Prophets, and the Writings. And when Rabbi Yeshua taught, it's amazing how we always taught from the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. It's called Tanakh. All right? And Tanakh is like a rod. Torah, 
Nevi'im and Ketuvim. So, he's speaking. And I believe just by giving us that, because remember in Luke chapter, was it 20, 24? Yes, Luke chapter 24, when he was going up on the road to Emmaus, he met two of his disciples, and they were discussing, and then he opened their eyes and he began to teach them. He didn't say, look, I am the resurrected Messiah. No, what did he do? He began to teach them from the Torah, Moses, from the prophets, and from the writings, all things concerning him. I would have loved to be in that class. You can imagine this supreme teacher teaching you in the Torah about him. Oh my God, that's a Bible study that you want to attend. You want to get, get to that Bible study because he's, he's going from Genesis 1-1, down to Malachi, and he's telling us, you see that dove there in Genesis 1, that spirit? That's me. You see that, 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 that ram caught in, in the ticket? That's me. You see that person who's standing by the Red Sea with hands stretched out? That's me. Are you beginning to understand? I'm saying, in the Tanakh, you see Yeshua HaMashiach. And when your eyes are open, you will recognize Moshe spoke about him. So, as disciples, we must have that prophetic mindset. And let's look now to Psalm 122. This is a precious psalm that all of us should know and be praying, right? A song of ascent. Notice, ascend. You always go up to Jerusalem and you go down from Jerusalem. You remember that? Jerusalem is always Aliyah. You go up to Jerusalem. When we leave Jerusalem, we go down. That's physically and spiritually. You go up, ascend, aliyah. But you go down when you turn your back from God. You go down to Babylon. That's why the parable says there was a man who was going from Jerusalem, going down to Jericho. Are you seeing it? Our master said you've got to understand the geography of the land and understand it so they could get the spiritual lesson. So this song of ascent, this song of going up, of David, I rejoice when they said to me, let us go to the house of Adonai. Mm. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. I want to pause and share with you the first time we went up to Jerusalem. We were going up to the western wall. And as we were walking there, it was Shabbat, we were walking towards the western wall. Our teacher at that time, our teacher, Moray Daniel Lancaster, would say, set us, stop. We are about to enter into the walls of the city. If you know, remember Jerusalem, you will understand what I'm talking about. You're about to enter into the walls. You're about to enter into the old city. And we stopped there. And you know what verse we chanted? Psalm 122. Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go up. Oh my God. And it was awesome. It was surreal to know that I'm standing there about to enter. And I'm saying, oh my God, my feet are about to stand with it. This is not just something that I'm thinking about. I actually stood there, oh my God, in the presence of God. That's awesome to think about. So Jerusalem is built as a city joined together where the tribes go up, even the tribes of Adonai, as a testimony to Israel, to praise the name of Adonai. Notice, you go up just to praise God. It is enough to spend all this money to go to Israel, to just stand by that western wall to say, God, I thank you. That's awesome. You say, well, I could stay home and thank yes, you. Yes, you can. But you could imagine to make all that sacrifice, all that expense, to just stand before God, where his presence is always, to say, God, I thank you. Your life will never be the same. I encourage you to make aliyah. If you haven't gone to Israel yet, make aliyah and go up, right? There the tribes go up the tribes of Adonai, as a testimony to Israel to praise the name of Adonai. Verse 5, oh, that, that's it, right? The tribes go up. Notice, the tribes go up. The tribes are making aliyah. All 12 tribes are going up. They're going up to the city of the great king. They're going up to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And by the way, when the scripture says pray for the peace of Jerusalem, he tells you what to pray. It's a little article that I wrote I will share with us eventually. When God tells us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, he tells us what to pray. And I would encourage us to pray that prayer often and regular. Remember, when you're eating and are satisfied, it's good to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for Canada. Yes, pray for Toronto, but pray for the peace of Jerusalem first. Because when peace comes to Jerusalem, you'll have peace in Toronto. 
All right? So pray for the peace of Jerusalem first, and then pray for the peace of Toronto, Canada. Oh, God, it would be a blessing, right? So let this happen, Father. Let us make a Leah. And we are praying now for the Jewish people to make a Leah. So go with me to Romans chapter 9, 28. I want to ask, what on earth is God doing for heaven's sake? What on earth is God doing for heaven's sake? Well, I want to give you an overview. This is what God is doing. For Adonai will fulfill his word where? On the earth, with certainty and without delay. There's something that God is doing on the earth with certainty and without delay. And he wants us to be a part of it. What on earth is God doing for heaven's sake? He's doing something for heaven's sake. That's why he taught, taught us to pray where? Your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. Matter of fact, that prayer, we tend to pray a bit of incorrect. We said that let your name be sanctified. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth. On, on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that phrase, on earth as it is in heaven, is connected to let your name be sanctified, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. That's how we should pray. That's how we should understand it. In other words, let your name be sanctified on the earth as the angels sanctified in the heaven. Let your kingdom come on the earth as your kingdom is in heaven. Let your will be done on the earth as your will is done in heaven. God wants his name to be sanctified, his kingdom to advance, and his will to be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And that's why we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What's the Hebrew word for Jerusalem? Somebody. Yerushalayim, plural. It's plural. Why? Because there is a heavenly and an earthly. So when we pray for the peace of Yerushalayim, plural, we are praying for the peace of the heavenly to descend on the earthly. Oh my God. That's the imagery that God wants to give us as we think about these things. So let's see what he's doing on the earth. Ah, the big picture. I'll give you three things. One, the gospel of the kingdom of God is being proclaimed. Look with me at Matthew 24. What is God doing on the earth right now? The good news, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. What is God doing on the earth? He's allowing his gospel to go. Now, unfortunately, we miss the message of the kingdom. So most of us got the gospel of salvation. There are men who went before, like uh, teacher Billy Graham of Blessed Memory. He was a mighty man of God. Proclaiming salvation. Powerful, powerful. And many came to accept Yeshua. It was a powerful message of salvation. But what the word says, the gospel of the kingdom. So I'm challenging us just not to have a, a salvation culture, but a kingdom culture. It's not enough to be saved. You've got to understand the kingdom mindset. So the good news of the kingdom is now going. Because now that missionaries have gone... And tell everybody about Yeshua. God is sending for the Torah, sending for the kingdom, sending for the understanding of Israel to the nation so that they would understand. It's not just about being saved to go to heaven. It's about allowing the kingdom to transform your life on the earth. So what is God doing on the earth? The kingdom of God. Second thing that he's doing on the earth, he is gathering a group of people. In Romans chapter 9, he tells us this. Romans chapter 9. Even us he called... Not only from the Jewish people, but also from the Gentiles. Now, I chose that verse because, again, I want to get within our minds that God is calling from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles, from the nations. It is both. So God is undoing the lie that says, in the church, everybody is the same. That is a lie. We're revealing that lie, and we're recognizing that God is calling from the Jewish people and from the nations. And he's making a community of disciples where Jew and non-Jew could live as one. Removing the hostility, but not the distinction. That's what he's doing. And what is he doing? He's bringing us together and he's sanctifying us, preparing us for his great name's sake. Oh my God. That we may be a wife, a body, prepared for him. And that's what you and I are going through in shul. We are being sanctified for his great name's sake. And he's calling from among the Jewish people and from among the nation. I'm saying that again and again. Because after 2,000 years of replacement theology, suddenly in 1948, Israel is back on the scene and theologians have to do a double take. 
Wait now, I thought God finished with Israel. What's happening here in 1948? How come he's dealing with them? What's going on here? And we got to rethink, right? Because God is uprooting every plant that he did not plant. And he did not plant replacement theology. And he did not plant dispensationalism. He didn't plant that. So that's been uprooted now. And he's given us an understanding that God is calling a people together. I pray that within CMI we would have Jews as Jews and non-Jews as non-Jews living together as one. We are one but not the same, but we are one in God. That is the bigger issue. And when we look at Father, we'll be able to live together in peace. I pray that we would have from the Jewish community people come to love Yeshua and come here. As he said, not only from the Jewish people, but also from the Gentiles. He's calling us to live as one. Oh my God, maybe get that wonderful understanding. But there's one more thing that God is doing. That is hidden in plain view. And that's what I want to spend some time talking about today quickly, right? So go with me at this one as we look at it. The third one is the return of Jews to their own land. Let me say that again. What is God doing in the earth? Returning the Jewish people to their own land. So one, he is proclaiming the gospel to everybody. He is sanctifying a people from the Jews and from the non-Jews to become a people, one. And he's doing something else that is hidden in plain view. He's calling the Jewish people back home to Eretz Israel. There are 70 passages that speak about the return of the Jewish people. It is amazing. 70 verses. As I read them in preparing for this message, I'm amazed at what God has already written. So look at this. Before you go there, how did the Jewish people come to the nations of the world? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Let's see what would have happened. You know the Torah. So in Deuteronomy 28, God says this to, to Moses. Adonai will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there, when you are scattered, including Canada, you will serve other gods. Oh my God. Wood and stone that you and your fathers have not known. So God is telling the Jewish people, I will, if you disobey Torah, I will scatter you. And he is faithful to bless and faithful to curse. So he has scattered the Jewish people all over the world. Because of disobedience on one hand, and because he wants the Jewish people to be a light to the nation. You've got to get both things. People normally say, okay, Israel is scattered because of disobedience and God is done with them. No, no, you've got to see what God is saying. He scattered them, yes, for disobedience, but he scattered also points of light into the nation of the world that were in darkness. So the people who sit in darkness will see a great light. Baruch Hashem. That's what's happening, right? So he has done that. And unfortunately, many Jewish people do not know their master. They don't even know the God of Israel. So they get involved in Eastern mysticism and all sorts of foolishness, secular atheists. Uh, 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 um, all, all sorts of, of, of thinking. It's amazing. Oh, Father, agnostic. They're looking for God. But that's what they do. It's serving. And if, if not, they don't get into Buddhism and Hinduism and all these things. They worship their wealth, which is exactly what God said. And so we have to pray against these things. So look what he said now in Isaiah chapter 60. In the prophet Isaiah, he's speaking. And when God speaks to the prophets, he's talking powerfully to us. Hear what he says. Who are these who fly like a cloud? Hmm. Like doves to their windows. This is the prophet speaking. And I looked at that and I said, who are these? The, pro the Spirit of the Lord is asking, who are these people? They're flying like a cloud. Hmm. Fly like a cloud? Fly like a cloud. I wonder if that could speak about airplanes bringing Jewish people back home. Do you get that? They're flying like a cloud. They're flying in the cloud. In other words, God is telling us way before that that was going to happen. It's amazing to see it, right? They're flying like a cloud. But think about a cloud. A cloud is moved by wind. So winds of persecution will also blow the Jewish people back home. Are you seeing that too? God, this is amazing. God is revealing. So who are these that fly like a cloud? Like doves to their windows. Doves? If you know anything about doves, I wonder, why did God allow me to raise doves as a boy? Now I understand. Doves, doves are, oh my God, 
They are so precious and special. You could send them forth and they come right back home. If you ever had doves as a, as a child, you would see that. And so God has said, I will make you homesick. So you're going to come back to Zion because you are homesick. You're going to come back because you're being persecuted, and you're going to come back because you have a longing and a yearning like a dove to return home. That's what God has said. So he's given us these wonderful things, and he's making highways. I believe he's making highways in the air, and he's making highways in the waters, and he's making highways on the land. I have read with interest uh, Gustav Scheller, a German man that God put up on his heart to bring the Jewish people from Russia. And he was in this, got a, a ship, God spoke to him, to get a ship and bring as many Jewish people from Russia back to Israel. They got on this ship, right? And look at, at this te text, Isaiah 43, verse 6. Because this is the text that they prayed. Imagine they're coming from Russia and they're coming back, right? I say to the north, give them up. North, that's Russia. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Oh my God. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And there's highways, highways in the sea. There's a text that says God made highways in the waters. They were traveling and there was a storm. And the ship was the ship of Jewish people coming back to Israel. And there was a storm and people forgot to get homesick. And God put up within this man's heart to pray this text. God will make highways in the sea. And they prayed that prayer. And there was a calm in the midst of the storm. They could see the storm raging on both sides of the boat, but in the middle there was a calm. Oh my God, it's making my head just stand up just thinking about it, but I want you to see it. There's storms on all sides, but God made a calm, a highway to bring that ship straight to Zion, to confirm his word that God, they have highways to Zion, God brought them back. And that is what God is doing. And that is a, a, a community, a ministry, it's called Eb Ebenezer. Um, emergency fund. It is Operation Exodus, and it's a wonderful ministry that I'm going to talk about and encourage us to support. But look with me in the book of Jeremiah. and I, I want you to see all these texts. Right? You probably you, you may not read it, have read them before, but I want us to give it now. See, I will gather them out of all the countries. Notice he says, I scattered them, right? But God says, I will gather them. I will gather them where I have driven them in my anger, my fury and great wrath. And I will bring them back to this place and cause them to dwell securely. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way so that they may fear me forever for their good and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never turn away from doing good for them. I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes. I will delight in doing good for them with all my heart and with all my soul. Mm. I will plant them in their land. I want you to see this because when I search scriptures, this is the only thing that I see God says, I will do with all my heart and all my soul. That brethren reached out and gripped my heart and my mind. That God is doing a work with all his heart and his soul. This He's putting his whole soul into this. He's putting his whole heart in this. And I said, my God, we need to know this. If you are doing this and, and we are your people, then you and I should be having this on our heart and our soul. So that's the understanding by God's grace. Because I've learned as a servant of God, whatever you want to see among your people, you have to preach. You have to teach because faith comes by hearing. So if I wanted to have faith concerning these things, I have to teach you so that the scriptures would grip you and convict you. And you would understand, God is doing this with all my heart and my soul. And we are his people. You and I should be doing it. That's why Rabbi is teaching on this thing now. Because he wants us to be a part of this. So, look at this. Remember I taught you that there are three visions. Three divisions of the Old Testament, Tanakh. Let's look at three times where God spoke in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, in the Torah. Let's see what he said. Now, when all these things come upon you, this is Torah, right? The blessing and the curse that I have said before you, 
to take them to heart and all the nations where Adonai your God has banished. You want me to see this? They have not entered into the land of Israel yet. They have not entered the land of promise yet. And God is already talking about bringing them back. Isn't that amazing? I want you to think about it. They have not gone over yet. They're still in the wilderness. And Moses is prophesying that God will bring you back. Which means he knew that they were going to be disobedient. But he knew that he's going to bring them back also. Oh my God. With all his heart and soul, right? Verse 3. And, and you will return to Adonai your God and listen to his voice according to all that I am commanding you today. You and your children with all your heart and with all your soul. Just as we just read. That Adonai God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you. And he will return and guard you from all the peoples where Adonai your God has scattered you. Oh my God. Even if your outcasts are at the ends of the heavens, even in Canada, from there, from there, wherever you are, from Australia, from South America, from, from Russia, from Argentina, from the Caribbean, wherever you are, your God will gather you, and from there, he will bring you back. I want you to see it, all right? Oh, my God. This is the Torah. That's why we read the Torah, so we can understand it. God, you will do it? Yes. Now, look at the... Prophets, look what the prophet said. I want to go with me to Isaiah 43. Do not fear, God is speaking to his people, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. Is that, is, is that clear enough? Oh my God. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back because the governments, the immigration will try to hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I found him. Yes, I made him. You begin to see what God is telling us to do. If he said, speak to the north and speak to the south, we are like Moses now. Are you beginning to see it? We are like Moses now going to the pharaohs of these countries and say, thus says the God of the Hebrews, let my people go. Are you beginning to see that? That's what God is telling us to do. Speak. Speak. Let them get their records. Let them get finances. Let them have a heart and desire to want to go. Speak to the north and speak to the south and speak to the east and speak to the west. Because God is doing our work. And in the book of Psalms, look at this. Psalm 107. Praise Adonai for he is good for his love and kindness endures forever. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Not just let the redeemer of... I've heard people say that. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Well, what is this so? The end, you, you, would you have, they stop right there. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Well, what is this so? The so is this. Let the redeemer of the Lord say the Lord is good for his mercy is, is everlasting. We don't say the first part. Yeah, let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Well, what is this so? <laughs> oh, my God. The redeemer of the Lord should say that the Lord is good and his love and kindness is, is everlasting. And how do we know? Let the redeemer of the Lord say, so whom he has redeemed from the hand of the foe, verse 3, whom he has gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the, and, and from the sea. Some wandered in a desert, a wasteland. They found nowhere to an inhabited city of Jerusalem. So they cried out, to, they cried out to Adonai, verse 4. They cried out to Adonai in their distress, and he delivered them out of their troubles. Right, verse Seven. Then he led them by a straight way to go to a city where they could live. I wonder which city, Jerusalem. Let them praise Adonai for his mercy and his wonders for the children of men. So, from the Torah, from the prophets, from the writings, we have same testimony. Out of two or three, I think is established. God is establishing this wonderful truth, and brethren, He's telling us to be a part of it. All the promises of God in Yeshua, yea and amen, through us, the glory of God. So you and I now get to be a part of it. So look what he says now in Isaiah. He says, listen, I want you to be a part of it, Isaiah 57. I want you to be a part of it, but there will be challenges. Then it will be said, build up, build up. Build up what? Build up the highway. Prepare the way. Remove every stumbling block out of the way of my people. Who is he talking to? Who is he talking to with that? Us, upon whom the ends of the world have come. Us, remove every stumbling block. In other words, God has said, you have to have a heart and a desire to participate with what God is doing. So in the book of Jeremiah, he tells us this. 
Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 7. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. That's Russia and all the other places. I will gather them from the ends of the earth. Every time you put on your talit, notice it has four corners. That's the world. Oh, my God. And God is saying when you bring it together, it becomes one. You're gathering from the ends of the earth, right? Like from your talit. Among them, he's going to bring the blind, literally and spiritually. The lame, pregnant, together with she who is in labor with a child. A great throng will return here. I remember the stories about Jewish people coming up from Ethiopia, and they gave birth on the plain. To fulfill this scripture, on the plane they gave birth. That's amazing to think about. God is at work. Can you see it? With weeping and supplication, they will come. I will bring them, leading them to walk by streams of water on a straight path where they will not stumble. For I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of Adonai, O nation, and declare it in the distant lands, and say, now watch this. God is telling the nations what to say. Let me say that again. God is telling the nations what to say. What should you say? Let's say it, please. He who scattered Israel will gather and watch over him as a shepherd does his flock. All that Canada will say, all that United States will say, Oh, that all the nations of the world will say, in every place where God has scattered his people, oh, that we will say. Oh, my God. Verse 10. For Adonai has ransomed Jacob. He redeemed him from the hand of one stronger than he. They will come and sing on Zion's height, radiant over the bounty of Adonai, over the grain, the wine, the oil, and the young of the flock. Their life will be like a watered garden, and they will never languish again. These are the words of the prophets. And God is telling us them because he wants us to see something. So, I want you to see something else. In Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Look at this. This is the text that the nation of Israel uses to celebrate a new holiday that they call Yom ha ha Aliyah. That's a, a new, a recent holiday in the land of Israel. A day to celebrate Aliyah. People coming back home. He said, I will lift up a banner for the nations. Think about it. I will lift up a banner. He wants the nations to see it. And I will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Question to you and I. Are you seeing by the Spirit of God the banner that is being lifted up? Are you seeing the banner? God said, I'm lifting up the banner. Are you seeing it? Next verse in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter, what was it, 18? All the inhabitants of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is hoisted on the mountains, look! <coughs> when the shofar is blown, listen! God is telling the nation of the world, look! See what I'm doing! Oh my God. And the other text in Isaiah, thus says that, and I look! I will lift my hand to the nation and raise my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons on their chest and carry your daughters on their shoulders. I want you to see something here. Who is he speaking to? If you looked at the movie Schindler's List, you would see Schindler would have seen that banner. But the other people he's speaking to, I believe, are redeemed non-Jews who have come to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who have come to know that he has not abandoned or replaced his people, and who want to participate with what God is doing. Look what he says. Thus says Adonai Elohim, Look, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons on their chest, which means they're going to intercede for them. They're going to carry them in their bosom, and they will carry your daughters on their shoulders. What could that mean? But shoulder the financial responsibility of the Jewish people going back home. Are you understanding why God is telling us this now? He wants us to do this with all our heart and with all our soul. That's what he's doing. And I believe... It's a powerful move of God, and I want us to not miss out on this, brethren. I've taught us it is better to give 
one dollar a thousand times than a thousand dollars one time because you want to develop and cultivate the habit of giving. After I preach this message, we have been saying many times, we have a slip there for Aliyah. And I think that you think it's only when we say Aliyah, then you stir up the gift for Aliyah. But that's not what God wants. If you get this, it means every time you put an offering, you will put, even if it's a dollar, you will put dollar Aliyah. Are you understand what I'm saying? It can't be a one-time thing. It can be one time in all the year you think about Aliyah. That's not the mind of God. The mind of God is that you're always thinking how blessed is the person who have highways to Zion in their heart. They're always thinking about Aliyah. And they recognize that God has saved them for such a time as this. And they have a re responsibility to help. So look with me to Romans chapter 15. Oh my God. I want, want us to see this. Oh Father, help us. For Macedonia and Acacia were pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are under obligation. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual blessing, they also ought to serve them in material blessing. Oh my God, are you seeing that, brethren? That is an apostolic mandate. That is an apostolic decree. Let me break it down for us. Since you have received spiritual things from the people of Israel, what did you receive? The unbegotten God of Israel. What did you receive? The Jewish Messiah of Israel. What did you receive? The Holy Spirit that was promised to Israel. What did you receive? The Torah, the prophets, the writing. What did you receive? All these blessings to be in the same way. What did you receive? All these spiritual things. Then you're bound to, must, under obligation, give material things. That's what God is saying. So if you have received all these things, but you don't give material things, then we are dead sea. We only receive it, but putting nothing out. We don't understand that God is saying, I want you to participate in doing this. I want you to partic participate in helping my people come home. And that's why we're talking about this today, brethren. Because I want, by God's grace, to challenge us. Challenge us. Stir us up. Start with the minimal and seek to excel still more. So you're given offering, put money for a leah. Put a dollar for a leah. Put a dollar because in, we, are, we are aligning ourselves with this prophetic understanding. So there is Operation Exodus, a Christian ministry that specializes in bringing Jewish people home. That's a good ministry to sow into. But how do we do that? When each of us, every Shabbat, imagine each of us, every Shabbat, put one dollar towards a year. At the end of the month, we have a little substantial thing to give. Don't you think so? Yes. And it's doable. But you've got to get the revelation. You've got to get the heart of God to do this. If you don't get that revelation, you'll think, well, that doesn't concern me. It does. Because it's on God's heart. So give towards Aliyah. Give towards the local Jewish need. We have a, a ministry here uh, via Hafta that you want to sow towards. We have to give to them to go back up, and we have to help those who are still here. That's our response. Didn't our master say, when you saw me hungry, you fed me and, and naked and you clothed me? Yes, if you did it unto the least of my brethren, think Jewish brethren first, you have done it also unto me. That's why I'm stirring us up, to give. And give repeatedly, consistently, sustain, because you get the revelation that God is calling you to participate in this prophetic drama that is being played out. So when you begin to see that, oh my God, you would internalize. That's why I want to teach us so badly about the one another's of Scripture. Because when you get that revelation of the one another, you would recognize this is the whole Torah service. That you see God wants you to help the Jewish people to go back home. Amen. That God wants you to pray that they break the golden handcuffs and they want to want to go back home. Why? Because you have received spiritual blessings. You're bound to. You're under obligation to give. And if you say, Rabbi, I can't afford to give, come, I will give you a dollar so that you could give something. Because the truth is, you cannot afford to not give. Oh my God. So I say, I cannot afford. No, you, you, you don't understand. 
You're in deception and denial. You're in denial. You're still in Egypt. Denial, denial. Did you get that? We fly over your head, right? Don't be in denial. We don't want you in Egypt. Come out of denial. Come into truth. God wants you to give. Your money is no longer your own. Why is Rabbi talking about this? Because I see that God says, you bring them back. You put them on your shoulders. You pray for them. And if you're not doing it, it means that we're not yet sensitive to what is on the heart of God. And Aaliyah is on God's heart. So I want us to be involved. But as I close, I want to take us to another, another part. Hmm. I've spoken to us about physical Aaliyah. That you and I as a congregation, we want to be known as people who support Aaliyah. That's a word that we should all know. It means to go up. It means that we are literally helping the Jewish people to make Aaliyah to the land of Israel. They need money to go up. They need to have a place to stay. They need food. They need medication. All those things. How do you think it's going to come? Through our giving. That's why we have to give continually. That's why I said do it little by little and seek to excel still more. Once you get a revelation, I no longer have to chain you up. It will do it naturally because you have seen. And if you're still hoarding it because you have not seen, you think your God is your money. Well, God will deal with it. Because you see when he prompts you to give, and you're here now, eh? God is speaking to you, and he's, he, he, he will tell you what to give. And I kid you not, listen to me, if God is prompting you to give and you don't give it, sometime during the week, you'll have to spend it on something that you didn't expect. Because he's going to take it back. Because you're being disobedient. He told you to give it and you're not giving. Well, okay, the money is mine. And so it's amazing when you begin to think about obey God. When he tells you to do something, do it because he knows. Hmm. Father, help us. But there's another journey that I want to take us on before I close. It's the journey of the soul. So in this week's store portion, we have all these journeys, right? In the book of Numbers chapter 33, this thing was written for our learnings. I want you to think now on a deeper level now. We just spoke about physical earlier, but look at this. These are the journeys of the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt by their divisions under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Moses recorded the stages of their journeys at Adonai's command. These then are their journeys by stages. He set out from Ramses on the 15th day of the first month, the first day of Passover. They went up with a high hand in the sight of all Egypt. Now the Egyptians were burying those who Adonai had struck down, right? Verse 5. Ben Israel left Ramses and encamped at Sukkot. That was literally happening, right? And for some of you, you are here because you have left Ramses. And you're now celebrating the festival of Sukkot. Are you beginning to see that? Oh my God, watch this. You and I were building bricks for Pharaoh. It's called being in the world. It's being Torah disobedient. Now we're looking to celebrate Sukkot because we have made a journey from Ramses to Sukkot. Our soul, there is a part of us that is non-physical that God says begins in me. And this is an awesome teaching that I want you to consider. But God is saying, listen, before you came in planet Earth, you were in heaven as a soul created by God. Jewish teaching says that when God created Adam, he created all the souls that will ever live up until the end of the Messianic era. All souls in Adam. And when we are born, God releases a soul from the throne of souls, from the womb of God, into your mother's womb. And you have come into this earth as a mission, a soul. That's why we pray. The soul that you put within me is pure. You breathed it into me. You formed it. You created it. One day you will take it from me and restore it to me in a time to come. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who restores restore souls to dead bodies. <clears throat> Vimru, amen. Amen. Baruch Hashem. So, I want you to see now, you are here. And what I'm looking at is not just your body, I'm speaking to your soul. Because there's a part of you that I cannot see in my natural eyes, but by the Spirit of God I see. And you're all spirits. You are souls. And all that you go through life, 
It's God taking you on this journey. That's why when people have near-death experiences, they see their life flash before them. <laughs> and all the experiences, that's your encampment. What the children of Israel went through is what you went through and what you're going through. And God wants you to learn these lessons by all these encampments. It's amazing. The shortest distance is not necessarily a straight line. The shortest distance the distance, uh, uh, you don't cry for a, a, a short distance. You want meaningful journeys. So I say, God, I want, I want this thing to finish now. No, no, no. You don't want a short distance. You want a meaningful journey. Your soul has left and come into this world so God could perfect. So Rashi says, why did God we, we, um, give all these encampments? To make Israel recognize how much God loved them. Because there are, at, there are certain camps where God would have destroyed the children of Israel. But because of his great mercy, he saved them. So every experience that you have gone through, think about the children of Israel. 42 encampments. And it's called going forth. And you ought to be growing. Your soul is being refined. Your soul is being perfected. Look what Job said. Oh my God, I want you to see this. In the book of Job, he gave this wonderful text. Job chapter 10 verse 11. Clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews. Clothe me. When I look at you and when you look at yourself, you're clothed with skin and flesh, right? And you're knitted with bone and sinews, right? But I'm talking not about your bones and your flesh. I'm talking about the me. Oh, my God. Did you get that? Clothe me. Who is the me? Your neshama. If you can receive it, non-physical, and you're clothed now with this flesh. But it's inside of you, there is a me, there is a neshama that comes from God and wants to go back to God. Look with me at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, where he says this. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we see, Then the dust returns to the ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who gave it. Oh my God. The spirit returns to God who gave it. You cannot return from where you have not been. I want you to see that again. The spirit returns to God. The spirit returns. And the only way you can return is if you have been there before. I'm saying you were there before and then you came into this world. Now you are going to be returning. If you get this CMY, you get this, those who are listening, you would understand your purpose in God. You would understand that God has sent you into this world on a mission. And you are going to experience all manner of things in this life, in this world, because your soul is being refined, your soul is being perfected. And every memory that you have, when you leave this world, you cannot leave with your riches. The only thing you leave with is the memories that you created in this life. And those memories must be wrought in God, because your soul bears record of everything that you do. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 90, teach me to number my days so that I could present to you a heart of wisdom. Are you beginning to see that, Psalm 90? Teach me to number my days. Teach me to make my days count so that I can apply to you a, a, a heart of wisdom. So teach us to number our days. I ask you how old you are. You talk, you talk about years. I'm talking about years. How many days have you lived? Because you want to return to God. You want to present to God a heart of wisdom. Beloved, are you beginning to, are you hearing, are you seeing what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Every experience you go through in life is to refine you and help you to make wise choices so that you can give back to God a soul that is refined, a soul that is pure, but would have been polluted by this world, but now becomes undefined with all the righteous memories, and you go back to God better than when he sent you. Oh, my God. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. Open our eyes to see these mysteries. You are the Father of spirits. And we ask you, God, to shepherd our soul back to you. That's what you're doing in this life. So, Hebrews 12 tells us now, Hebrews 12, watch this. But you have come to Mount Zion. 
not to Mount Sinai, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. That's your soul. To heavenly Jerusalem, that's returning. And to the myriads of angels who are waiting to welcome you back in. Oh my God. They saw when you left. They were there when you left to come into your mother's womb. And they are waiting to escort you back into the presence of God. That's why when people are dying, they say, I have this vision of two, these two men in white standing by my bed. I don't know if you ever heard those experiences, but that's true. Their, their souls are drifting and they say, I see two men in white standing by my bed. What is that? That's angels sent to accompany your soul back to God. And it better be that they accompany your soul back to God. Because there's another place that they can accompany you to. All right, okay? But to millions of angels, to joyous gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn, mm, Israel, and who are written in a scroll in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. And what's the last verse? What's the last verse, brethren? To the spirits of the righteous ones made perfect. Whose spirits? Whose spirits? Your spirits. Your spirits are being made perfect. Are you seeing that, brethren? That's why you come to shul. To hear the word of God. To perfect you. To, to cast off all the ungodliness and unrighteousness. To let go of all these things so that your soul could soar with God. So that you can understand what on earth is God doing among the Jewish people and preparing us to be a part of it. My spirit is being perfected. When you get that, you wouldn't complain when you go through trials. You would say, Lord, bring it on. Because that trial, that suffering perfect my soul. I need to buffet my body and subdue my soul so that it will obey God. That's what God is doing. So we are kingdom Zionist people, brethren. We are going up to Zion. And, and it is awesome what God is doing. We are... We are, we are people on a journey. And I pray, God, that you would get this takeaway as I close. Oh, my God. <sighs> Father, open our eyes to see that you want CMY to participate actively, continuously in Aliyah. I'm praying, God, that you would see this revelation. I'm praying, God, that as a messianic community, we will be known for supporting Aliyah. I pray that we are after would know that we are people who give to help. I pray that Nefesh, Nefesh, a Jewish organization, would know that there's a community in Canada who supports Aliyah. They may not want to hear about Yeshua yet, but they cannot deny our love and prophetic insight to help the Jewish people go back home. And that's your responsibility. If God could get it through you, he would get it to you. You could never outgive God. You are never more like Father as when you give. That's why he said, God so loved the world that he gave. Once you're on the giving side, you are like God. Once you're on the getting and taking side, you are like the devil. That's why you can't be takers. All through life you're takers. You're of the father, the devil. We don't want to be that. We want to be givers. But we tend to hoard. We tend to be in unbelief. We tend to feel that that doesn't concern us. It does, beloved. After today, I hope that no one will say, oh, that don't concern me. I hope from now you, you'll know it concerns you. And rather than spend $5 to go buy that Coke, and I'm speaking to, to myself first, put the $5 aside and say, that's $5 towards a layer. You've got to be intentional. You've got to see it. I could do without this ice cream. Are you understand what I'm saying? You could do without certain things so that you can help God's people to make a layer. Then do that. I'm, I'm telling us, you have to be intentional. If you don't do that, <laughs> but no, we're going to be doing it, right? As a community, we're going to be doing it. We're going to be given towards Aaliyah. We're going to be given towards Via Hafta. We're going to be given towards the building fund. We're going to be given, as I said, if each of us, every Shabbat, just take one dollar, one dollar, every, it will add up. 
And to whom much is given, much is expected. You could give more, give more. And I tell you, if you can't afford to give, oh my God, come, I will give you a dollar. Listen, back home in Trinidad, we, I had a container put within the shul for people who would come up and say, Rabbi, I can't afford to give. I say, you see that bottle there? That bottle there has a whole set of dollars. Take one dollar and put it in the offering. Because I'm training you to give. You can't, you can't say, I can't afford. I'm trying to knock that out of your senses. I can't afford. That's a lie. <laughs> you cannot afford to not give. And when you get that, oh my God. And there's something else. I didn't mention this before, but I'm saying it because we used to do it back home. People who are still struggling with giving tithes, they struggle because they can't afford. You see, I have all these things to do. And I can't afford to give this month, probably next month when things get a little better now. And I got this teaching from a pastor of blessed memory. And we have practiced it. And I'm telling us we will practice it here also. But I say it very cautiously and reverently. And this is it. Dawn knows exactly what I'm going to say. I'm telling you, you cannot afford to not tithe. I'm telling you this. Tithe. Give. And if it is, listen carefully, I speak as unto those who are spiritual. If it is that after you have tithed, you have said, Rabbi, I cannot live. I need money to live. You know what we, have, what we did back home? We gave back people the tithe. Say, like, what? Yes. You see, the practice is you got to release it. If you don't release it, the whole hundred will be consumed. But when you release it and you receive the blessing, now you are blessed to give. Now, if every month you're coming back with the tithe, something wrong. <laughs> something wrong, big time. But I'm telling you, you cannot afford to not give. And you have a blessing that we tried so hard to get in Trinidad. Tax deductible. I think that's a win-win situation. You know, hardly work together, we didn't get that. And you have it here now. It's a win-win situation. You give, and then the government tells you, I was going to bless you back because you give. And then you take that back and don't drink it, drink down your whole gravy. Bring it back and put it back in the system again and let it go again. Are you seeing what I'm saying? It's a win-win situation. The government is telling you I will bless you to give. Oh my God, the children of the world are wiser than the children of light. God is telling you to give. That's why at the end of the month, you should bump up your offering. Why? Because you're going to get a tax credit, which you're going to get back, which you're going to put back in CMY again. And it just continues going. Oh my God, you could never outgive God. When you and I begin to see this, brethren, I believe we would be transformed as a community. And I'm praying, God, that we would get this. But, ah, Father, bear with me. Oh, my God. There is a lady who I listened to this testimony. She had what is called a near-death experience. And she said she met Yeshua, and Yeshua began to tell her. I'm just paraphrasing. Some of the things that she experienced in the earth. And she said Yeshua put in her whole life in front of her. And she saw when in high school, she spoke to this boy a hurtful word. And she said Yeshua showed her the effect of her words on the person. He, she saw how the boy inside shriveled up, died. She saw the effect of her words. Because it was one soul speaking to another soul. When she saw that, she said, oh, my God. Long story short, when her soul was put back in her body, she tried to make amends. Why am I saying that? Because I've been teaching us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And when you love your neighbor as yourself, in the end, you will live your neighbor's experience as yourself. Oh, my God. We should do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Because one day... 
we, we will experience what we did unto others as if it was done unto us. Oh, my God. I believe there's someone who's going to meet you in the economy of God and will thank you for the day when CMY you heard, give to Aliyah. And you would have released that money because you believe God. And they are now in a relationship with God because they've come back to the land of Israel, come to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to his Messiah, because you release one dollar to help that person make a leah. Isn't that powerful, brethren? Wouldn't you want that person to come up to you in heaven and say thank you? Yes. How do you think it's going to happen? Through wishful thinking? By you putting it in the envelope, that's how it's going to happen. You're laying up treasures in heaven. And if you're not laying up treasures, I tell you, some of you, when you get across there, expect a little cardboard box. <laughs> because that's what you, that's what you stand for. Are you, uh, 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 so I'm saying, you have so much, but you're so uh, distrusting of God that you hid it. So God said, you, this mansion that you're expecting is a little cardboard box, because that's all you stand for, you know. You send some little pennies, and so I'll, that's all I could build for you. But if you're generous and you outdo in giving, because you can't outdo God, when you get up, they say, oh my God, all this is mine. Yes, you will lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust and thieves can't break out. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Stop serving mammon and serve God. Let's rise to our feet, brethren. God and Father of our Master, Yeshua, we thank you for the words of truth that you have given to us. Put within our hearts highways to Zion. Help us as a community to be givers, to want to sow materially towards your people making Aliyah. And help us to be mindful of the journey of our soul from the throne of souls in this world and returning to you. And we pray as a community, God, we would know before whom we stand. We will know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We will know that the very life that you give us is yours. The very money that you give us is yours. Our time, talent, and treasure is really yours. And of your own, we are given back to you. So, Father, open our hands that we will not be tight-fisted. Open our hands that we would give. Give what we can. And try to do even better. And from today, Lord, I pray that when Sister Cheryl counts, we will see an increase, a sustained, regular increase in Aliyah. Hmm. In local Israel needs. In meeting the needs of our brethren. In meeting the needs of the homeless in Toronto. In meeting the needs of the building. We are a community of givers and not just takers. We have seen your world, O oh God, and we pray that you would put highways to Zion in our hearts. And Father, let us not be afraid that you will take care of us. If you put upon our hearts a monk to give, let us be obedient and give. Not be afraid. You will not be forsaken. You will not be begging bread. Your bread and water is sure. Bread will make a loaf for you. Your bread is sure. Don't worry. You will eat. But let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added to us. Thus says the living God, have you seen my banner? Have you seen my banner? It's lifted high. Don't you see it? I'm waving it. I'm trying to get your attention. It's a menorah, and it, 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 it's the two, 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 two angels, as it were, two witnesses, and they're pouring the oil into the menorah so that the testimony of God is there, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, says the living God. I am hosting a banner. Can't you see it, CMY? Can you see it? I want you to get involved in bringing my people home. Others are not seeing it, but now you have seen it. Would you turn your back? God says, Listen, I give you an opportunity. Don't have me to make you put money in a bag of holes. 
Because that's what's going to happen if after you heard this message, you intentionally dig your feet in and said you can't afford to give. God is saying to you, you can't afford to not give. And I pray, God, that you would supply the needs of your people, that we would be givers. And that every month we'd be able to make a substantial contribution from this little flock. Even there's a hundred dollars from a community. But the faithfulness would be there. For we have seen it now. You want us to be involved in Aliyah. So God, as we lift our hands, we say, may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and grant us a peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, who's causing us to make aliyah and causing us to participate in his brethren making aliyah. Thank you, Lord God, for myriads upon myriads of dollars, thousands upon thousands of dollars coming into CMY so that we could be givers and give us that grace to steward your funds rightly, God. But first, stir us up to be givers and bring unexpected income from the east, west, north, and south so that we can give back in the work of the kingdom. Have you not given us power to get wealth? Yes, so that you could establish your kingdom on the earth, which involves the people of Israel coming up to Jerusalem and our souls being perfected, set free from stinginess and greediness and unbelief, set free to be generous givers of God. Give us a good eye as a congregation and bless us with your blessing. And all God's sons and daughters who get this revelation and wisdom are not so thankful and would be forever changed, say amen, amen and amen.